Türkiye'yi gazeteciler için dünyanın en büyük hapishanesi olarak izleyen ve journalists in Turkey who are behind bars. Ben buraya dünyanın en büyük gazeteci hapishanesinden geliyorum. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of the Listening Post, coming to you from Istanbul. Last month, Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, held a rare press briefing for journalists here. In that meeting, Erdogan said that freedom of the press was of, quote, vital importance to him. It was a statement that failed to square with the facts, let alone the numbers. Because for each of the past three years, ever since July of 2016, when an attempted coup failed to depose Erdogan, Turkey has imprisoned more journalists than any other country in the world. In this program, we will take you behind those numbers, unraveling a complex and sometimes contradictory picture, a story that we'll examine in three parts. To begin with, we'll look at the many journalists who have fled Turkey to avoid ending up behind bars. Later, the ironic flip side to that story, how a country that's been described as a living hell by many of its own reporters has become a safe haven for journalists from other countries, primarily Arab ones, who come here to work for fear of being jailed at home. In between, we'll get a perspective on the government's treatment of journalists, including behavior that borders on the dictatorial, from one of President Erdogan's staunchest supporters in the Turkish news media. But first, The Listening Post's Flo Phillips on Journalists in Exile, Part 1. Just a few months before I was kicked out, um, I was uh, already attracted a lot of um, attention by the government uh, with my reporting back then. There was an arrest warrant against me. We thought that they wouldn't come to the newspaper, so I actually stayed in the newspaper overnight but they came to the newspaper and my editors were staying with me so they told me that I should flee from that door. Uh, I left Turkey because of the prosecutions that had been brought against me. I had already been to jail for my journalism so this time I chose a different path. I was facing 20 to 25 years in jail. My passport had been revoked. So like many refugees, I got on a boat and crossed the Meriç River to Greece. I published a story about the government of Turkey who was trafficking arms to a neighboring country illegally. I found myself in jail first and then in exile. Of course, leaving the country was not an easy decision. I left my hometown, my family, my job, my paper, my library, my dog, everything, uh, my life, I left it behind. But I knew that this is the price of being a journalist. Jan Dunda, Chadash Kaplan, Mahir Zainalov, just three among scores of Turkish journalists now living in exile. For the past few years, the government of President Erdogan has carried out an aggressive campaign, monitoring, targeting, prosecuting and jailing reporters. For some, the situation became so dire, their only option was to flee. Jan Dundar was one of the most prominent newspaper editors in Turkey. He ran Jim Hurriyat, the country's oldest daily, a centre-left paper that routinely investigated and took on the ruling government. For the past three years, he's been living here in Berlin. He came here after spending time in a Turkish prison for publishing a story that exposed illegal arms support, weapons that the Turkish intelligence services were providing fighters in Syria. He was sentenced to almost six years behind bars, and he decided that life in Turkey was no longer an option. He couldn't deny the story because it was true, but he said it was a state secret, so it shouldn't be revealed. So I was getting a lot of threats by the government and by the troll army. I was attacked in front of the courthouse. I saw someone coming to me 
and he called me as a traitor. So you were convicted for revealing state secrets, but you pleaded innocent and were appealing the decision. Why didn't you stay in the country to clear your name? Because uh, I lost trust in Turkish judiciary. Uh, after the military coup attempt, uh, Erdogan changed the whole system. The first thing he has done was to arrest the high judges who decided for our release. So they are still in jail without independent justice. Really, you can't defend yourself. So that would have been uh, putting my head into the guillotine. Bu metnin e, tüm e, Türkiye Cumhuriyeti kanallarında yayınlanması Türk Silahlı Kuvvetleri'nin bir emridir. On July 15, 2016, a faction of the Turkish army attempted a coup. It was a spectacular failure. Using some of the very media outlets he'd been attacking before, Erdogan rallied popular support, stopping the coup in its tracks. Milletimizi illerimizin meydanlarına davet ediyorum. Havalimanlarına davet ediyorum. The government pinned the blame on the Gulenist movement, forces loyal to the Islamist cleric Fethullah Gulen, a one-time Erdogan ally turned enemy. The event was a watershed moment in the country's history, and for the media, it marked a seismic shift in their fortunes. Within two weeks, more than 100 media outlets had been shut down, and in the years since, those considered inconvenient to the government have been taken over by Erdogan allies, while journalists critical of his policies have been systematically rounded up and imprisoned. One of the media houses forced to close was Zaman, a company widely seen as close to the Gulenist movement. Mahir Zainalov worked for Zaman's English language newspaper, Today's Zaman. But his struggle with the government had started well before the coup. On 25th of December 2013, I wrote an article about the corruption case which targeted President Erdogan. So when I um, wrote that story, all hell broke loose for me. One of the uh, newspapers just published my profile picture just saying that Turkey beware of this traitor. And on that day, President Erdogan pressed charges against me, uh, seeking up to six years in prison. Why do you think the Erdogan government and Erdogan specifically took such extreme measures? Uh, there are some red lines that you should not cross. One of them is undoubtedly uh, corruption investigations that targeted President Erdogan. Another thing is the military coup attempt. You cannot question it. There's also the Kurdish issue. There are like over 60 journalists um, that were deported from the country. And most of, most of them um, were kicked out of, expelled from the country just because they wrote about Kurdish issue, Kurdish conflict. The battle in the southeast of the country between Turkey and Kurdish insurgents demanding equal rights and autonomy has lasted more than 40 years. The leading insurgent group classified as a terrorist outfit by Ankara, is the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK. The group, its leaders and its message are all red line issues. Covering human rights abuses by Turkish forces is fraught with challenges, and Kurdish language media operate under significant restrictions. Chadash Kaplan was one of 32 Kurdish journalists arrested back in 2011. For him, the most dispiriting thing was not so much his arrest, but the lack of support and solidarity from his fellow journalists. The journalists who didn't speak up for the Kurdish media back then, today they are the ones being victimized. I hope my colleagues don't mind my criticisms because I'll criticize them on any platform. For example, Zaman newspaper. When Zaman was shut down, I defended them and said it was illegal. But when I was arrested in 2011, Zaman labeled me a press terrorist. He's absolutely right. And, and I think many, many newspapers uh, yesterday and today failed to support those uh, causes. And that's a tragedy of the Turkish society, is that the victim does not support the other victims. And Kurds have always been alone in this fight. They're not alone anymore. All three of these exiled journalists have been classed as, quote, terrorists by the Turkish state. We contacted various representatives of the government requesting interviews. However, none of the officials agreed to speak with us. 
From their homes in Athens, Washington DC and Berlin, Kaplan, Zainalab and Dundar continue with their journalism. It hasn't been an easy journey, particularly so for Dundar. What sort of pressure or intimidation have you continued to feel, both from the Turkish government, but also from the pro-Erdogan supporters living here in Germany? And there are a lot of Erdogan fanatics around and they are trying to intimidate. And, and there's a Turkish intelligence uh, activists here, I guess. There are informants among the society. And Erdogan himself came to Germany and called you out, is, is that right? Officially, he asked German government to give me back to Turkey. But thanks God, German government knows what, what's going on in Turkey. For some of Turkey's exiled journalists, those goings on resemble a living hell, one in which the ability to report freely, to hold power to account, and to expect due process seems all but dead and buried. Freedom of the press in this country has been buried in a big grave by our leaders, not just by Erdogan. We have to fight for it, just like our other rights. We have the power to dig up these fundamental rights from the grave, but we can only do that by resisting. Otherwise, it's impossible. We wanted to get the Erdogan government's response to some of the allegations made by Dundar, Zeynalov and Kaplan, journalists the Turkish state calls terrorists. We requested interviews with a number of senior state officials, including the president's director of communications, his spokesperson and his special advisor. None of them agreed to speak. So we asked for an interview with Jem Kuchik, an Erdogan loyalist and a prominent face on the privately owned TV channel TGRT. Kuchik agreed, but with strict conditions. He said he did not want to answer any questions about the Turkish government's handling of specific journalists, in particular the exiled reporters we interviewed. He said our questions would be better answered by a representative of the state. He did, however, defend certain other statements about the media made by President Erdogan and some of his closest advisors. Gazetelerin köşelerinden orayı sularlar. Oranın bahçıvanı olarak, fikir babaları olarak, düşünce babaları olarak işte onları yetiştirirler. Ve bir gün gelir bakarsınız ki bu insanlar karşınıza terörist olarak çıkarlar. Eğer PKK terör örgütünü, Fethullah Gülen terörist terör örgütünü övmek basın özgürlüğüyse ya da bu insanlar birer hak arayıcı gibi göstermek gerekiyorsa o zaman söylenecek çok fazla bir şey yoktur. Bu şuna benziyor. İngiltere'de, Amerika'da ya da bir Batı demokrasisinde yani biri çıkıp El-Kaide'yi anlayalım, DH'i anlayalım derse o zaman bu fikir özgürlüğüne mi girecek? Türkiye'de biz e, gazeteciler Batı'ya e, FETÖ'nün yani Fethullah Gülen terörist hareketinin ne olduğunu anlatmakta belki zorlanıyoruz ama bu insanlar neticede Gazeteciler, gazeteci değiller, bir şebekenin, bir terör örgütünün birer parçası durumundalar. There are no journalists imprisoned. No journalists. When I said there are no journalists, there are no people convicted of journalism for what they've written or what they've done as journalists. They are convicted under Aa, other so crimes. Erdoğan'ın danışmanının dediği şey bence doğru. Türkiye'de gazetecilik yaptığı için insanlar içeriye girmiyorlar. Batı'nın Türkiye'yi anlamaya çalışması lazım. Bunları sadece gazeteci olduğu için içeri atılıyor algısını yaratmaya çalışıyorlar. Bunlar gerçekle ilgili olan şeyler değildir. Bunlar terör örgütüyle bağlantılı olan e, gazetecilerdir. Ülkenin e, seçilmiş meşru hükümetini devirmek için faaliyet içerisinde olan gazetecilerdir. Biz bu konuda Batı'yı ikna edebilir miyiz bilmiyorum. Çok da Batı kamuoyu veya Batı'daki gazeteciler, Batı'daki... E, siyaset bizi çok bu konuda anlamaya çalışmadığını düşünüyorum. İnandırıcılığını ve itibarını kaybetmiş bir medyanın açık söylüyorum. Ne topluma ne de insanlığa hiçbir faydası olamaz. Biz basın yayın organlarının 
halk adına siyasetçileri denetlemesine, milletin çıkarları için gözcülük yapmasına asla karşı çıkmadık, çıkmıyoruz. Türkiye'de medya aşağı yukarı son 70 yıldır sürekli değişim halinde. Zaman zaman bu gazetelerin, televizyonların, radyoların, internet sitelerinin sahipleri değişiyor. Karşılıklı olarak bunlar birbirlerinin kanallarına da gidip geliyor. Hükümeti destekleyen yazarlar, gazeteler, televizyonlar var. Hükümete muhalefet edenler var. Ama onun dışında her zaman Türkiye'yi de eleştiren güçlü bir muhalefet, muhalif ses olduğu muhakkak. Bunların da hepsi zaten her zaman Türkiye'de yayınlar yapıyorlar. Hepimizin üzerine titrediği medya özgürlüğü işte bunun için vardır. Journalism may be under siege here in Turkey, but there's a specific group of journalists, foreign ones, thriving here. In the aftermath of the Arab Spring, hundreds of reporters from Egypt, Yemen, Libya and Syria have all fled authoritarian governments, oppression, prosecution, in some cases war, to come to Turkey. There are more than a dozen Arab TV stations now based in this country, most of them right here in Istanbul, beaming their content back home to the Arab world. Now, the irony of all this, as well as the apparent hypocrisy, Turkey jailing its own dissident journalists while playing host to those from foreign countries, is not lost on either Turkish reporters or their foreign colleagues. They all know that there are politics at play here. We've come to Istanbul to speak to Arab journalists about life in exile, as well as the space that's been carved out for adversarial journalism aimed at the Arab world. أكثر من 10 مليون كيلو متر مربع هي مساحة الوطن العربي لم نجد كيلو متر واحد فقط يحتضننا لكي نمارس فيه مهنتنا بكل حرية وجدنا هذه الكيلومترات في تركيا إسطنبول كانت إحدى تلك الوجوه لأنه هناك العديد من القنوات أو الوسائل الإعلامية التي أتاحت المجال للسوريين أن يكون عندهم سقف حريات معقول عشان بيقول كلمة أستطيع أن أتحدث أن أقول أن أنتقد كما يحوي في الوقت الذي أريد دون يعني أن يتضجر مني أحد غير الظالمين والدكتاتوريين ودون يعني أن يملي علي أحد ما أقول فهذه هي الميزة بخلاف مثلا الصحفيين في مصر في بلدي اليمن من عام 2011 حتى 2014 وهي فترة ما بعد ثورة الشباب السلمية الشعبية كانت فترة طفرة للصحافة وأيضا لكثير من المواهب والإبداعات وكل ما يتعلق بفنون الحرية هذه الفترة لم تمتد كثيرا لأن 2014 وهو الانقلاب الذي قام قامت به الميليشيات الحوثي على الدولة في اليمن هنا عاد القم او عاد الوضع اسوء مما كان عليه مجرد فكره ان تمارس الحد الادنى من الصحافه في تلك الايام فكره مجنونه وخاصه للاعلاميات اليمنيات هذا كان سبب خروجي من اليمن الى تركيا وسبب كثير وسبب ايضا نفس السبب لكثير من الاعلاميين قناة بلقيس كانت فكرة محمولة في لدى نفوس كثير من شباب خاصة مجلس شباب الثورة السلمية في اليمن إحدى التجارب المثيرة للمشاعر وأيضا جميلة قامت بها قناة بلقيس خلال الشهر الفائت وهي أنها لأول مرة تزور كثير من من العوائل أو الناس أو الأطفال الذين قامت بتغطية قصصهم خلال فترة الحرب شعرنا نحن داخل القناة بأننا دائما نغطي مشاكل الناس ودائما نغطي أوجاع الناس فهذا انعكس علينا بشكل سلبي 
جعلنا نشعر بكثير من بالاسى بالمشاعر السلبيه في بعض الاحيان الاحايين البسيطه كان هناك فقدان للامل في بعض الاحيان هذا البرنامج عاد من الامل باننا عادت كاميرا بلقيس هذه المره ليس لتنقل اوجاعكم فقط ولكن ايضا لتمد لتمد يد المساعده هذا عندنا يعني حاجه كبيره حق الاجيال عند الاهالي لا يستطيعوا الاهالي يبنوا فصول مثل هذا لا استطعنا لنا 18 سنه ما استطاعت يعني الاهالي يبنوا انا وكثير من مئات الاعلاميين وغير الاعلاميين الذين يعيشون في تركيا ندين لتركيا وللشعب التركي فعلا احساسهم ب بالشباب الذي كانوا فعلا يتطلعوا للحريه للامانه ان اخترت ان فتحت لي كل دول العالم لكي اعيش فيها فلن اختار بعد اليمن الا تركيا ما كنت أتخيل يوماً أن أغادر مصر ولكن بعد الانقلاب العسكري تعرضت كما تعرض كثير من المصريين للانتهاك والامتهان في عهد عبد الفتاح السيسي بين المطاردات وبين السجن وبين الاعتقال لذلك بعد أن أمضيت مدة ليست بالقليلة في سجون السيسي في السجن قررت بعدها الخروج لأنني رأيت أن مصر لم تعد مصر الصورة أن مصر لم تعد لأبنائها وإنما مصر بقيت للعسكر لذلك قررت الخروج فكانت رحلة مليئة بالصعاب والمتاعب حتى وصلت إلى اسطنبول قناة الشرق لها ميزة ربما لا تكون في كثير من مسيلاتها وهي أنها قناة تجمع الكثير من الأفكار والأراء والأيدولوجيات هي قناة أرى أنها تبحث عن الحقيقة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حلقة جديدة من الغربة أما بالنسبة لبرنامج الغربة فكانت فكرته من الأساس لأننا جميعا خرجنا في بلاد المهجر بعضنا أو أكثرنا خرج مضطرا مجبرا رغما عنه لأننا كلنا عايشين في غربة ومحدش مرتاح اللي جوه واللي برة فكانت فكرة البرنامج أن يعني نعايش مثل هذه الثقافات نرصد مشاكل المغتربين نحاول أن نضع لها حلولا نحاول يعني أن نتحدث إليهم وأن نستمع إليهم ونسمع منهم كلمة المغتربين والمهاجرين والصحفيين والإعلاميين في بلاد المهجر خرجوا جميعا من أجل كلمة الحق يدفع الثمن الكثير من الشباب المصري في سجون عبد الفتاح السيسي أما وقد من الله علينا بالحرية فينبغي أن نظل ونثبت على كلمة الحق برنامج نور خانم اللي بيقدمه على تلفزيون سوريا هو برنامج سياسي اجتماعي ساخر بعتقد انه اللي قدرنا نقدمه بهذا البرنامج كشيء جديد او اضافه جديده للاعلام المعارض خلينا نقول هو انه نحن قدرنا نلمس عدد اوسع من الشرائح الصحفي السعودي جمال خشقجي اهلا وسهلا فيك اكثر مقابله يمكن عملت ضجه هي مقابله المرحوم جمال خشقجي كانت تحديدا قبل خمس ايام من اختفائه في السفارة السعودية اليوم خسرت سوريا العديد من الفقرات اللي قدمناها عملت صدى كبير سواء كان في سوريا أو في الوطن العربي من الأشياء ممكن هي كانت خطاب بشار الأسد الأخير فنحن أخذنا الخطاب ويعني حللناه بكلمة كلمة وطلعنا الانتقادات الموجودة فيه نحن بحاجة للنقد عندما يكون هناك تبصير ولكن اهم شيء ان يكون النقد هو نقد موضوعي. اوه لك والله عشنا وشفنا النقد صار مسموح لنا بالبلد بس مو اي نقد ها لازم يكون بموضوعيه. لكم ان تتخيلوا يعني المحللين السوريين على الفضائيه السوريه او الاخباريه السوريه عندما يقوم بشار الاسد ب اي خطاب او اي كلمه او اي تصريح تقديس يعني يعني أنا برأيي ما لم يقله سيادة الرئيس بالأمس كان أبلغ 
وأكبر مما قاله إذا مفكرين إنه الكلام اللي حكاه السيد الرئيس مهم وبليغ ما تسمعوا بقى الحكي اللي ما قاله إيش بصير فيكم؟ يعني انتقاد شخص الرئيس بيعمل بيعمل جنون إنه هذا الرئيس بشار الأسد لا يمكن إنه نحن نقرب عليه أو ننتقد شيء مثلنا أكثر ما يزعجني من الانتقادات اللي توجه لي في البرنامج إنه أتفضل أحكي من جوا سوريا وكأنه أنا مجرد وجودي خارج سوريا لا لا يمنحني الحق بأن أعبر أو أنتقد ما يحدث في في بلد حلمي إني أنا أقدم برنامج ساخر أنتقد فيه رأس النظام ونستطيع أن نقول لرأس النظام أو لأكبر شخصية في النظام أن أنت مخطئ وننتقده ونسخر منه دون أن نعود للنوم ربما في ما بقول عنا بسوريا بيت خالتنا يعني نرجع ننام ببيوتنا You've been watching a special edition of our program in Turkey, a country that, while offering refuge to hundreds of Arab journalists, has grown into a giant prison, be it metaphorically or literally, for many of its own reporters. A concerted campaign of intimidation, arrests, and closures by the government in Ankara has ripped huge holes in the Turkish media fabric. The fact that Turks, at least those who look beyond their television screens, can still find news and information that questions the official line is a testament to the courage of those who risk their safety and their freedom, be it at home or in exile, in the name of journalism. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.